All right. That's the one, mate. All right, uh, Eamon Sullivan, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you doing? Good, Hawkey. It's good to see you after bloody 10 years since you, you left Australia and moved over to the US. I know, mate. I uh, kind of felt like I turned my back on the whole system, you know, and uh, came and took on a new life. But uh, just just fell into work and got busy, as as you know, which, which you're doing right now. Where are you right now? Uh, I'm in Perth, my hometown, uh, back here and in my backyard because the kids are screaming inside and the vacuum's <laughs> on. So only peace and quiet I can get at the moment. Right now, I, you know, we're going to talk about your swimming career, obviously, but you're in the restaurant business. And how did, how did all that um, come about? Because when I knew you were, you were this um, superstar swimmer and now you're a superstar chef and, and restaurateur and, and all that sort of stuff. What happened? Yeah, definitely not the chef. Uh, just always loved food, mate. I think um, when I was just left school, the only thing I really enjoyed at school was doing cooking classes because you got to eat food during the day and got a bit of extra fuel. Um, and once I left school, uh, when I was still living at home, I just used to cook a lot in between sessions. And that's kind of where I took the next step uh, in the swimming um, aspect of just taking a bit more care of my body. Um, growing up and seeing your rig, mate, we had a, had a lot to live up to. So I, I'd be uh, pretty, um, pretty small, soft body when I was younger. And I never really took much, much focus on my diet. And then... Um, once I started cooking, I started learning actually what went into things you ate when you're out and about and, you know, scrambled eggs are full of cream and butter and all those sorts of things. And I started to take a lot of interest into, into diet and cooking at home. And, and then that sort of progressed. Um, I just really enjoyed it. And then when I moved to Sydney, um, got the opportunity, I went into celebrity master chef, um, just cause my managers knew that I liked cooking and managed to take out the title there and, and that I'd always wanted to sort of open a small cafe in my hometown and, and managed to do that after, after that and getting a bit of credibility, I guess, and a bit of uh, PR around that. And then it just sort of snowballed from there. And, and once I retired, I really jumped into the second venue we opened and now we've got, uh, yeah, five venues uh, around Perth. So um, yeah, just was able to jump into it without having to go to uni and it was a great, great opportunity of, of just transitioning a few mindset things and work ethics into a different a different way of uh different way of living yeah I mean, really interesting mate what are some of the similarities you think between what you learned as a swimmer and how did you take that into the restaurant business and how's that been effective for you i think um the biggest one for me was just if you really want something finding a way to get it uh, and for me i knew nothing about hospitality uh i knew how to cook food and 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 what sort of things cafes served you know, and what the trends were and, and where the gaps were living in Sydney and coming back to Perth back then, there was a big difference between the, the, the quality of cafes and restaurants and, and the price points and the innovations in, in dishes. Um, and for me, it was just research. And that was the same from a, a 16 year old kid, um, reaching out to people like yourself when you came over to Perth and Jason Lazak and uh, Roland Schumann when I was younger, I just, I was hungry to learn and I was reaching out to people, finding out and, and they were nice enough to, to get back to me and, and, and give me some time. And, and that's kind of how I, I started applying some of those things that I learned from those guys to my training. And, and for me, it was just reaching out to restaurant guys and the guys from MasterChef and, and trying to learn how to run a business. And um, for me, I just, I put a lot of hard work in and a lot of, a lot of hours um, to get my knowledge to where it needed to be to open the venues. And every day I'm still learning new stuff and, and trying, to, trying to make them better. But I think, um, there's definitely been some tough times and, and like there is in training, it's just that mindset of getting through the tough times with the knowledge, your long-term plan is going to take off and just putting in the groundwork and the every day, just having that, that mindset about getting that little bit better. And that's kind of what we've done over the years each time. And we've learned every week, every year we've been open and adjusted each business and each business kind of gets better and better each year um, from a, from a financial perspective. So that's kind of, uh, I guess, just taking that, that real obsessive mentality of, of being a sprinter of just that little, little one percenters that make the big difference in the long run. Fantastic, mate. I know a lot of people depend on you for their livelihood and, and for their paycheck. And, you know, I've seen what you've been doing through this period. It's been tough on all small businesses. I work for a small business myself and I saw the stress that it had on, on my boss. So I'm sure you've been under enormous stress and just taking that leadership on board and um, I know, uh, you know, a lot of people I'm sure are very thankful for, for what you've done for them over the past few months. Yeah. Thanks mate. It's definitely been, yeah, the toughest, toughest thing we've been through as a business. Um, you know, especially just riding the wave of COVID and, and also, yeah, we've got about 100 and, 
110, 115 staff across all the venues. So mm. just want to make sure that they're still okay. And there's some that obviously didn't qualify for a lot of the assistance we've had, but I think, you know, the government's probably helped the most as far as the assistance we've got to be able to pass that on to the staff and to, to keep the doors open at a, you know, a different form. Yeah, it's been, been pretty tricky, but I guess it's innovation. It's got to happen at some point in any industry. And, um, we didn't innovate, innovate heaps, but we had to think different ways of just how to keep the doors open and how to keep things under control. So, yeah, it was tricky, but um, yeah, I guess it's one of those things you get through it and you've got a story to tell and hopefully you've learned something along the way that stays with you. Yeah. Well, mate, let's get into swimming a little bit. Um, you know, the first real time that I got to know you, I was coming towards the back end of my career in, in 2004, heading into the Olympic trials. Um, you know, and I qualified, qualified in the 50 freestyle. So I really didn't um, mess with the hundred, but you, you kind of jumped onto the scene as a young, was it, was it 18 or 19 at that stage? Um, I think I just turned 18. Yeah. 18. Wow. So like 18 year old coming onto the stage and, and qualifying for your first Olympic team. Did you have expectations of, of making that team? And, and, um, well, just talk me through that. Yeah, no, not at all. I think, um, a lot of people asked me when I thought I was going to make an Olympic team. And I said it was when I touched the wall and store, I came fifth in that final and qualified for the relay. Um, heading into that, um, I'd made, made the Youth Olympic team, I think, earlier that year. I think it was January that year was Youth Olympics in Sydney. And um, I was training with Todd Pearson, who had just come back after the, after the Sydney 2000 Games from the AIS. And obviously had, had been there uh, with Klimi and a lot of the guys. Um, doing sort of that 100 metre. And when he moved to Perth, he um, kind of wanted to start a sprint program. He'd been doing heavily the, the 200 over the years and he was trying to come down to the 100 and he was getting older as well and wanting to train a bit differently. Um, and that's when him and Stolly sort of got together, my old coach, and um, came up with the sprint program uh, that I kind of joined essentially from from where I was as a 16 year olds just doing what everyone else does you know a lot of kilometers and things that didn't really suit me and i was lucky enough that todd took me under his wing and I, again it's just one of those scenarios that right place at the right time um training with toddy and his mentality of he was the you know they called him hollywood for a reason he was kind of that whole uh he had the hollywood mentality but he also worked really hard and had a great work ethic he was a really good role model to train alongside and and you know days off on a sunday we'd go for a 10 kilometer run you know instead of just having a day off and just trying to find different ways to have fitness so leading into that olympics it was mainly just probably the the year leading into that is when i started getting closer and closer in those back end speed sets with toddy and and occasionally touching him out on the wall and I didn't think much of it at the time and, and eventually I just managed to put a good hundred together and, and coming home pretty strong. And I think that was my strength that year was I was coming home and I think 24, eight or 25 low that year, but only going out in a sort of 24 mid. So I was kind of even splitting it back then, which was pretty rare for me. Um, and yeah, it just all clicked at that Olympic trials. And I think I was ranked 22nd leading into it and, and came away fifth in the final. I went from a 51 mid to a, a 50.2, I think it was. Um, so it was, it was pretty surprising for me. And I was, um, especially my first go at it, going into that final, I think I was ranked fourth and I came fifth. Um, I think I turned seventh in the final and managed mm -hmm. to, to come back into fifth place. And um, yeah, it was a, a pretty surreal moment being 18. And um, my best mate, Adam Lucas, had made, made, the, made the team in the 400 IM earlier in the meet. And it was something that I just, that's probably what really drive me to, Get, keep my head together in that final and make it onto that team so I could uh, continue our traveling around the world and having fun together. Yeah, mate. Well, there's a lot of young people that are in that situation, where, whether it be in uh, Australia or the US, and they're, they're heading into trials next year, let's say, and there's a, there's a lot of young talent around. So how, how do you go from being a young talent who makes the final um, to actually making the Olympic team? Like, what, what are some of the recommendations you could give to a young kid and maybe some of the things looking back in reflection that you did well on that day? Uh, I think uh, back then we, we were doing a lot of work with our sports psychologist who was travelling with us, with our, with our state team. Um, he was just always around pool deck. And it was just part of our, our culture of just chatting. Um, it wasn't necessarily in a dark room. It was a quiet room and and talking about your feelings, but it was just there for that person to chat to when you might have felt nervous. And um, I think having Toddy around as well made a big difference. Um, 
I reached out to him a lot, you know, heading into Olympic trials. I think it was my first Olympic trials I'd ever been to. Um, and, you know, the difference between a, a normal nationals where there's not really any, anything to qualify for or that's a world champs or something off the radar. But Olympic trials, there's a lot more cameras, a lot more news crews. Um, the intensity is, is really there. Um, and I think I was ready for that before I got there, even though I wasn't anticipating to make the team. Um, Todd had done a few talks to the younger crew heading to their first nationals and first Olympic trials about what it's like mm. being at Olympic trials um, and the differences between just a normal swim meet and what we were, we were used to as to what was coming. So I think I was mentally already ready for what was there. And when I turned up, it wasn't a surprise. I think if I hadn't have listened to that talk or had have just assumed it was a, a standard meet and I turned up, it would, the reality of it probably would have, uh, would have made me a bit more nervous, I guess. Mm. Um, but I guess it's, it was just, a, just one of those meets where everything just clicked for me. Um, I knew I was fit, I was, I was racing well, and I just managed to, to have a great time and, and surround myself with people that calm me down. I think that's the biggest thing for me is um, my, my sort of mentality, my mindset changed over the years from when you're a up and comer with nothing to lose. It's quite easy to, to have fun and just, just focus on yourself and it changes when you, you start to have a target on your back, your mentality heading into a swim meet and, and how you approach a swim. Um, but that meet for me, it was all just about sticking to my routines and not getting caught away with what, what could, could happen in the future. It was focusing on the race plans we'd, we'd practiced a lot, time over time of executing, um, the pre-race rituals, the massage, the, the swim downs and not getting carried away and excited with, with what was going on, but really sticking to what, what we'd planned. Mm, mate, good advice. I love it. Um, you, we've we've all got nicknames in Australia, and uh, you've got one that kind of sticks out to me, and, and I want to know where it came from. Um, but a lot of people call you Mad Dog. Why, where'd you get Where'd you get Mad Dog from? I gave it to myself. Funny, <laughs> <laughs> it was it was. I think someone called me Mad Dog once, just as a just as a uh, just as a joke, and I kind of liked it, and. Um, I remember we used to have to fill out a biography for, I think it was for Ray Warren. Um, for, the, for the trials, you had to fill out a biography form. So I kind of had your, your name, your date of birth, your nickname. And I kind of put the, the regular one, solo. And then I just put a comma and put Mad Dog, just as a bit of a joke. <laughs> and uh, I think that's when it stuck, was Ray Warren was commentating a race. I think it might have been that final or a semi-final. And, and it was like, and here comes Mad Dog swimming up. And, and as soon as that came out, everyone just started calling me Mad Dog. So it was kind of, uh, kind of a joke to start with. And then, um, and then it just stuck. That's awesome, mate. So, what, so talk us through the experience of the Athens Olympics being, a, being an 18-year-old. Um, what was that experience like at that time? It was a whirlwind. I think um, thinking back on it, it's kind of like what Christmas feels like when you're a kid you kind of remember glimpses of it, but it's just so exciting and so shiny and new that you kind of, the whole experience is just so blurred. And maybe it was the after parties in the second week that maybe caused that to be a little bit blurred. But um, <laughs> the, the whole lead up, it was, it was surreal. I remember, you know, I went to the 98 world champs when Klimi won, uh, I think it was six or eight gold medals. And I was, it was in Perth and I was there every day with my mum and, was sitting in front of his dad and I turned around one day and gave him my hat. My mum gave it to him because I was too scared to ask him. I think I was 14 or something. Um, it was 98, so no, 12, would have been 12. Um, mm. And asked him to sign the hat and his dad took the hat and said, yeah, yeah, I'll get him to sign it. And I said to my mum, we're not getting that hat back. <laughs> and um, it got, and Clemmy signed it and his dad gave it back to us the next session. Um, and I was just idolised, you know, Thorpey and Clemmy and, and yourself growing up as well. And, and then all of a sudden I was on a team with all the same guys swimming in a relay with Klimi. Um, it was just, just surreal. And I was just so nervous to, to kind of be myself that I was just so quiet. And um, as you, you probably saw over the years, I came out my shell a little bit. Um, but yeah, it was kind of, just, it, it's, in some degree, I felt like I didn't deserve to be there. I felt young and inexperienced and you know, I'd done a 50 point uh, at that time. It was, it was relatively good. 40, low 49s were kind of the benchmark of, of world-class standards. Um, and yeah, I just felt young and out of place. But at the same time, I was just so excited to be there. I was just, I just took everything in and, and tried, I tried to have so much fun every day. And you know, I was lucky enough to make the final. And you know, I don't think I was swimming fast enough to be in the final, but 
and luckily um, I think Ash Callis just wasn't swimming that well at the time and, and he swam the heats with me and um, the coaches decided to put me in the final. So all of a sudden I'm in an Olympic final in my first Olympics swimming with Thorpey, Klimi and my, my training partner and mentor Todd Pearson. It was, it was just an unreal meet and uh, I, uh, yeah, shaved my head stupidly just because I wanted to be part of the boys and I think it was Hacky and, and Klimi decided we'd shave my head. So I had a bald, bald head with a, a white head because it wasn't suntanned and just this skinny, awkward kid um, swimming half decent in his first Olympics. It was just, um, just surreal. Yeah, mate, I'll be honest with you. You know, at the age of 29, which I was at the Athens Olympics, I'd seen kids come and go, you know, to be honest. I'd seen kids just like you uh, kind of flash in the pans, make it at the, at the skin of their teeth, you know, fifth place, and, and then get on, get on a spot and then never see them again, you know, to be honest. And, and I thought you may have fallen into that category. And uh, so I want to talk about how you went from that to becoming world record holder, no doubt about it. But but there certainly was a funny story at the Olympics, and I don't know if you want to talk about it or not. But there's a, there's, uh, a there's, big, <laughs> <laughs> there's an epic after party story where you end up in hospital. Are you, do you want to share it or not? Uh, yeah, we can. We can. <laughs> um, it was, and it was a bit of a the story kind of evolves depending on who tells it. I, I know parts of it, I guess, but I think it was the I think it was the first night and. Uh, the first night after swimming had finished. First night after swimming. Yeah, not the first night of competition. <laughs> um, that was probably back in the 80s maybe. But uh, yeah, and you know, we'd had a few too many drinks. And I th- there was this little gazebo thing at the back of the party. I remember it was on the beach. It was mm. just this amazing, amazing venue on the beach. And I think I just said, oh, I'll climb this thing and dance on the roof of this little gazebo thing. And I climbed up and it just collapsed. And it fell down, <laughs> fell down and I had a cut on my elbow. I was had a cut in my hip and that was bleeding a little bit, but I was fine. Um, and then I think it was Steve and Toddy like, shit, what are we going to say to the managers? You know, oh, I will just say he was sitting on the balcony next to the beach and someone knocked him and he, and he fell off. And we thought that was a smart plan. But then because of that, they're like, Oh, we've got to make sure he didn't, you know, get concussion and everything. So they took me to the hospital to get my, um, a st- I think it was a stitch in my, my hip where I just had a little puncture wound or something. And, um, but and they're like, oh, he got knocked off a balcony and the doctor's like, oh, we'll have to, you know, scan him and make sure he doesn't have concussions. So I'm sitting in this x-ray machine and this MRI is whirling, whirling around my head and we couldn't understand what they were saying. And um, I think the team managers were like, just said to the doctors, just keep him in for two days to keep him out of trouble. And um, I ended up spending two days in the hospital with these just no, no connection to the outside world. My phone was dead, looked out the balcony and just buildings ever. I had no idea where I was. And contemplated just walking out and trying to find my way back to the village but um i think everyone else all you boys went to mykonos for two days while i was in there so i missed out on a, on a good time just from a miscommunication and a, a stupid uh thinking that i could dance on top of a, a flimsy metal gazebo <laughs> man it was a, it was an epic story it was funny funny as hell and uh, it's funny to be there and witness it but again you're you're just a young kid so i thought to myself like well we're never going to see this kid on an australian team again <laughs> But mate, you go on and have uh, incredible success. Obviously, you know, you become world record holder in, in multiple events and, um, you know, Olympic medalist and all sorts of different things. So it's an interesting path from, from where you were to where you, where you get. And so I certainly want to go uh, across a bit. I mean, you had, you, you did have injuries throughout your career and they started, I think in 2005. And I think you ended up having like six hip operations is that correct uh yeah five in total and that i think it started in 2003 so i'd already had two two hip ops um before before the olympics in 2004 mm, wow um yeah just unlucky I had yeah shoulder injuries since i was 15 just bursitis tendonitis um just ongoing all the way through my career um yeah five arthroscopes in my hip just from torn cartilage which is just just random um, um subluxed vertebrae in my back just dislocating fingers finishing in races and just breaking you know fracturing heels in training accidents and just stupid things all along the way and um a bit a bit of unluckiness unluckiness is that a word um bad luck along the way um i think looking back on it it, it's kind of um the periods where i was injured the most i actually swam better 
And um, the periods where I wasn't injured, I actually got to the point where I was overtrained and, and fatigued and, mm. and really didn't swim that well. And that was probably something I didn't realise until I kind of made my comeback after two shoulder surgeries and was doing 20% of my normal workload. Um, and when it, I think a 21, six in shorts or 21, eight or something after six, six months training. And mm. it, it's, it, the penny drops just as I was about, about to retire that, um, you know, that the type of sprinter I was, I, I didn't need to do the kilometers. And, um, those injuries probably actually helped me over my career, actually have a longer career. I think mm. if I had um, not had them, I would have been a different swimmer. That's interesting, mate, because I've had some conversations recently with some people who are in quarantine and, and doing kind of one a days and saying they feel stronger and faster than ever. Um, they just, they're just healthier, whether it be physically and mentally, they're, they're, they're ready to go back to the pool and, and have a great workout. Um, and they're just not getting pounded and pounded and pounded. Um, so there is, there is certainly hope that people will come out of this quarantine period or whatever period they're in right now where they're not getting the normal type of training and be, um, you know, far, just as fast or faster. So, mm. you know, what do you, what do you think it is in that, that, that helped you in that sense? Uh, it's hard to put your finger on it, but I, I know, I know for a fact I was not a long distance swimmer. I wasn't, Mm. I could never do a 200. I think my PB is still officially 204 for the mm -hmm. 200 free. Um, I didn't go faster than that after all. I think it was, I think it was 16. That was the point I actually nearly left my coach. I did a 200 free. I think it was just, just as Toddy Pearson came back from the AIS. I did a 200 free and that was my PB. I went 204. I think I went out in a 58 and came back in a 106 or something. Like just the, you know, I just blow up. Um, even the 100 I'd blow up. But, um, I just couldn't do it. My shoulders just couldn't handle um, long distance in training and, and my, my, my anaerobic capacity, aerobic capacity in, in anything over 100 just wasn't there. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't train for it. Um, the two kilometre time trials you used to do as kids, I'd feel great the first 400 and then I'd just fall apart and then I'd, I'd just get slower and slower. My shoulders would burn. And I just, I just I didn't know whether younger, you just think that it's, you just need to train harder. Um, and I tried it. I tried training harder and, and nothing really changed for me. I still couldn't do those long distance sets. Um, but the sprinting stuff worked for me. Um, my lactate would go through the roof, just getting out of bed. Um, and after that race, I said to Stolly, I said, uh, he said, he, he accused me of not trying basically. Mm. Um, I told him to jam it. And I said, I was going to move to a different coach. Um, because I said, I'm not going to train with someone who thinks I wasn't trying. And I took it to heart. And I was literally about to leave. And Todd Pearson called me and then that's when the whole sprint program thing happened mm. and training changed dramatically from doing two kilometer time trials and doing, you know, 50, 60 K weeks going down to more that 45 K 45 K mark and having two recovery sessions in the week where we just do two and a half K of technique and drills and, and just giving that body time to recover. Um, and I, I went, you know, over the years I went to, I never swam more than a hundred meters freestyle straight. If I was doing a set of four by twos, I'd do a hundred free, 50 back, 50 free, mm. um, just to get my shoulders to recover. Cause what I found was when I, I tried to swim with longer distances, my technique would fall apart and I'd just be practicing bad habits. Mm. Um, we've evolved, evolved our training over the years. And I think, you know, I certainly looking back at my career that, uh, 2004 to 2008 when I was swimming my best we were probably swimming 35 to 40 k's a week um when I, when I moved to Sydney we we changed environments and had new new guys swimming with us and it kind of felt like that you know Skippy Hugel joined and Andrew Lauderstein, Matt Abood, um Libby Trickett was there as well we had a really good team and we went from a really um comfortable training method and knowing what I needed to do to being in an environment where you're kind of competing again with with other people you're racing against and it changed my mindset. And I think I, I got to the point where I was overtraining and Stolly was evolving as a coach as well. And maybe the guys that we were training with could handle that training a lot more than me, but my mid mid seasons were, were, um, were just atrocious and I managed to pull it together for the, for the big races and the, and the, um, the national champs and, and, and qualifying for teams ongoing. But from, from when I was uh, back in Perth, I could, get up any day of the week and swim a 49 point. Um, if I put a suit on and in training, I was, it was in that, in that realm leading to, to Beijing. I, I think I did 50 or 60 sub 50 swims in a row. I just didn't, 
didn't go over that 50 second mark, no matter what my training load was. Um, but when I went to Sydney, I was swimming 51 points, you know, sometimes a 52. And then by the time I got to racing, I'd, I'd dropped down to a 48, five. Um, mm. It was a real mental battle doing that. And, and coming back to Perth, after I had that shoulder surgery, I was doing 15 to 20 Ks a week, um, max. Mm. And, and maybe one or two swim sessions hard a week and focusing on strength and technique. And um, in six months, I went from a, you know, 22.5 to a, a, I mean, I, my first 50 I did was a 23.0. And then six months later, I went 21.6. Um, mm. And it was just, it's, it was, over the years, I think those injuries has probably forced me into that training regime where I was actually resting a lot more. And I was in a state of semi-taper almost all year round. And I'd, I'd build up and I'd, I'd get fatigued and my body would break down and I'd probably go into a week of recovery. And I think that kind of forced me into a cycle of recovery. Whereas when I wasn't injured, I just pushed way, way further than I should have, I think. And got to a point where I was just so fatigued, I couldn't even get myself to the point of an injury because I couldn't try hard enough. And mm. it's, it's something that I, I only look back on it now and realize that's probably what happened. And mm. um, yeah, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Mate, uh, yeah, I, I think you discovered something because, look, around the same time I was coaching Fred Busquet and Cesar Cielo and, and we didn't go over 25K and, and both of those guys ended up swimming 20 point in the 50 and, and uh, Freddie, I think, was 47.1 in the 100 and, and, and Cesar's obviously got the world record 46.9 and, and we, we just didn't go over 25K and people um, laughed at us, they criticized us and, and yet we were, um, swimming just as fast as you were at the time. And, um, you know, some of the best, some of the fastest swimmers in the world and, and people put it down to, you know, all sorts of different things, uh, especially the suits. Um, yeah. and yet, and yet here we are where we're in a situation 10 years later and I feel, this is my personal opinion, you know, um, many world records have been broken since then um, across many different events. And yet the 50 and the hundred freestyle are still world records from 2009 when we were doing, you know, 25 K a week, a max and, and swimming uh, a lot of speed work. So um, talk to me about maybe a speed set that really sticks out in your mind or something that you really enjoyed doing. Is there, is there a workout? Is there a set? Cause I know people that listen to this really love the sets. Is there something that sticks out in your mind where you, where you really love that set where you repeated it? I don't think I loved any, any training set we did. <laughs> Usually the speed sets would end up me vomiting. So I always dreaded our speed sets and our lactate tolerance sets, but I suppose they're the ones that I, you know, the sick part of me enjoyed them because, you know, when you push yourself to that limit and you throw up, you kind of know you've, you've, you've done your dash and you've had a good session. Mm. I think when you walk away from a session knowing you, you could, you had more to give, you kind of, I would always get frustrated with myself, but you know, the, the toughest one, there's a couple. There's the toughest one that I, that I hated doing, um, but it was, it was great training for the 100. And then, you know, there's two different sets we did. One was a big, always our Saturday morning set, which was more aimed at your back end speed for your 100 and, mm. and trying to build that tolerance. Um, well, that was more sort of building 100. And then we had our lactate tolerance sets, which was just, you know, the, the throwing up mentality of just learning how to tolerate your lactate. And that was literally just, I think it was 8.50s on eight minutes max for me. Um, and it was all push. Um, I think it was on, yeah, it was on eight minutes. You just sit around and let the lactate build up and just try again. And I'd always start off at, you know, maybe a 23, 23 mid and end up at like 28 mm -hmm. on that last 50 and just throwing up probably from the fourth or fifth 50 every time. And that was the one I hated, but eventually I think we got to the point where I'd, I kept them under 26 seconds. Um, for all of them and started off a little bit slower, but was able to, 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 to manage that lactate a bit better. Mm. Uh, so that's probably my worst set that I kind of secretly enjoyed because I knew I would get a lot of benefit from that. Um, the, the one I really enjoyed the most was a uh, Saturday morning set. Um, cause it, it really, you could, you could swim against an IMA and still be able to battle it off in the last 50. So we, I think you did this set with us once when you came over to Perth hockey, um, mm. it was four fifties. Uh, it was a dive 20, mm -hmm. um, a push 30. Mm -hmm. And if you add those two times up, it's supposed to equal your first 50 um, for your 100, your ideal time. And then we do a 50 recovery and then a 50 back end speed. Mm. So ideally what you're trying to do is hit within half a second or, or close to what you want to be swimming your, your ideal 100 at. Um, and then the other guys like the Omers and the middle distances would just do all 450s hard. So... 
that sprinter mentality, you kind of feel like you're getting a little bit easier and that ego strokes that you get to relax and everyone else was getting a little bit pissed off that you had a 50 recovery in between and, and you'd match up with your mates on the, the last 50 that were doing I am and you just throttle them and you just enjoy doing that every time and they'd be pissed off they didn't get to recover and and complain and you just you just use it to, to your advantage and you're always just able to push that little bit harder on that 50. Um, and I think we'd repeat that uh, about eight times, I think, mm. from um, yeah. eight to ten times. Um, yeah, so mate, it's get- one of those sets that I did with you that uh, actually stole from you guys and ended up um, doing it with, with some of my athletes on, on a repeated basis. I loved it. I thought it was amazing. But it was also one of those sets that I did with you where I, at that time you, you dusted me up pretty good on that workout. And I remember thinking to myself, this, this guy is the future. Like, I, I can't hang with this kid. You know, he's, he's better than me. And, and it was kind of right at the end of my career where I wasn't injured and I wasn't, um, I wasn't getting any slower, but I was certainly, I could see the end was near where, where I was up against a young stud like you. And I was like, this, this kid's got me, you know? And, and that was just one of those sets in my mind where I knew that like, I, I got to call it quits here in a minute because this guy's about to explode, you know? So um, mm. I could definitely There's see it in you. There's always that point in your career, isn't there? Where you mm. get to that point where their workouts just get harder and the young kids come up and make it look so easy. Um, and that's probably where the mental battle begins, doesn't it, for the, for the end of your career of how yeah. you're going to get to the end. And, you know, I think I wish I had have discovered that, that sort of that golden 20 to 25K mark for me a lot, a lot earlier. I think mm. um, definitely would have made those four years that I felt like I was overtraining a lot easier and, and probably put me in a better mental state to, to, to get through it all. But... Um, yeah, those, those were the years though. It's always those years you enjoy where training's easy and you can push yourself and you can back up and, and do it every week. It certainly gets harder when you get older. Yeah. Mate, one of the highlights of your career, I think pro- probably the highlight of your career was in 2006 when you uh, finally took down my Australian record. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was that like to take me off the board, man? Did that feel good? Um, yeah, I guess... I guess it's one of those, that was definitely the first one. I think it was my first, my first, um, first nationals winning an actual title as well. Yeah. Um, so I think it was, I think it went 22 flat. I think mm. it was. Yeah. 22, zero, zero. I just looked it up on Wikipedia. 48, six, I think in the hundred, I think. Um, and that was the first time I'd won a national title. It was on the back of the com games. Um, a pretty fun com games we had in 2006, I think. And then we had the world champ trials, in December, I think that year. So it was kind of like pretty close and there was a pan packs in between. So there was a lot of racing that happened that year and just lucky enough to have a lot of practice. And yeah, I think it, for me, it was, that was that, um, that turning point um, after, uh, I think when you, you asked before about that turning point of going from a, a relay swimmer as a young kid to, to, um, to that next progression and, and getting to the top was yep. probably the, the difference between 2004 to 2006. Um, there was 2005 um, where I wasn't selected for the world champs and I came third in the 100 free. Um, mm. And it was after a couple of, another hip surgery, I think like six weeks before the trials or like two months before. Mm. Um, and I just managed to, I think I did a PB by 0.01. I think I went 50.01 or something the year after the Olympics. And that was, two months of not being able to kick my legs and six weeks before trials, I was able to start kicking and and I came third. I thought that was enough to get on the relay team and and Tom, I decided not to select me um, and choose a relay team from guys that had had made the team Mm. um, from the 200s and they ended up getting a silver medal. Um, I think our qualifying time for the top four was like 0.2 off the standard or something and that really pissed me off. And I think um, my mentality through my whole career with my injuries was you kind of had kind of, had two options. You could either be down and out and use it as an excuse and go into hiding and get miserable and be pissed off and eat chips and put on weight and slack off and use it as an excuse or come back bigger and stronger. Um, and for me with the hip surgeries, I kind of didn't have a choice. I could always strap my legs together and um, I could go to the gym and do chin ups and shoulder press and everything else with my arms. And that's kind of what I did over those hip surgery processes was I just hammered my, my upper body. And that's where I got a lot of my, my power to weight ratio was just hammering the chin ups and, you know, went from a scrawny kid barely, barely being able to do 10 in a row to be able to do, you know, three sets of 20 chin ups. And I think my max was 65 kilos for one rep um, in chin ups when I weighed 75 kilos, I think, or 78. Mm. Um, and that was just 
just from doing that when I had three hip surgeries and six weeks in a row every time it was just chin ups, chin ups and and more chin ups and rotator cuff exercises and and strengthening that. And I guess when I hit two thousand five after three hip surgeries and getting to the point of, of swimming in Olympics with your best mates and your idols. I remember I said to myself after, after Athens, I don't want to ever miss a team again. I want to be, I think, it, I think 2004, it was um, Matt Welsh and Brooke Hansen a bit on the team for 10 years. And, and I think Hansen put a 10 year uh, video together of them over the 10 years. And I said to myself, I want to get one of those, mm. um, you know, we'd just done the, I think the rookie night and everyone was just, it was just that moment where I was just like, yep, this is what I want to do. And, I want to keep doing this. I never want to miss a team. And uh, 2005, I missed a team, not because I didn't qualify, because someone chose not to take me. And um, I remember the World Short Course trials were right on the back of Orlando. Um, and they all went off to Orlando for the World Champs, all my mates, and I was stuck at home. And I spent those two months in the lead up to that, I just upped my training. I went from doing normal training, I added on I think two or three spin classes a week. I went for my runs on Sundays. I was stretching. I was doing yoga. I was doing Pilates. And I, tr I just shredded up over those couple of months. Like I just went from a skinny, chubby kid. Uh, I don't know how you can be chubby and skinny at the same time, but I managed to pull that off. Um, and I, I came into that Melbourne World, World Short Course um, trials. And I think I tied with Ash in the 100 and won the 50 or, some, or other way around or something. So that was my first real national title in a short course. And I just, I just, swam the meat of my life and I just gave me so much confidence and from there I just kind of kept pushing and and kept adding things to my repertoire of training and 2006 is kind of where it where it all culminated it went from short course to to, to com games trials where I qualified for the 100 and I think you were still in the 50 then mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I qualified for the 52 actually so we we're in the 100 and the 50 and we had the relay together they were my first individual swims on a national, uh, international level. And then it just sort of went from there. And each time I've had that feeling, I just never wanted to lose out on it. Um, but it's funny you say that because I had a very similar experience in, in 96, missing the team by three one hundreds and actually qualified for the relay team. I finished six and it was within the qualification standard. And uh, Don Talbot decided not to take me. And, uh, yeah. and, and I remember thinking, uh, you know, for many years after that, uh, that, I'm not, I'm not going to be in that position again. Like next time I get a chance to make the Olympic team, I'm going to take it out of their hands and I'm going to make sure they have no choice, but to take me like, I'm going to win the event. Like my mentality before that was, I hope I make the Olympic team. And then my mentality shifted to no one's going to beat me. No one's going to stop me from making this team. They have to take me cause I'm going to win. And it sounds like you had a very similar shift in mentality going from just a, a relay type guy or, you know, someone right there as to someone who says, no, why I'm going to, I'm going to take control of this. I'm going to start to win these events and I'm going to start to become the dominant sprinter and, th and they've got no choice then. So it certainly is a mental shift, right? Yeah. I think uh, especially in sprinting, you kind of have to be up yourself. You know, I think I remember seeing you strut around in your singlets and your spandex when you were doing, doing weights and you were quite happy to get out of, um, out of the pool when everyone else was still swimming laps and, stretch and you know you've got to take that sprinter mentality um, oh well, i mean i had an incredible physique at the time i couldn't i couldn't disguise yeah. it no you still can't mate it still comes <laughs> through um, but you really do and i think that's where um you know you see a lot of sprinters over the years and yeah. some that i you know that that can train really well and you know, i'd get towed up in training time to time as well and when it came time to the race they wouldn't go much faster and mm. um there is a big difference from training well and racing well. And that's, that comes from confidence and, 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 and um, knowing that you can put yourself on the line regardless of what training you've done and what's happened in the past and be able to get up and perform. And I think injuries again is probably what I kind of stumbled onto was uh, through injuries. There was, uh, it was probably three or four, 2004 was one of them. 2005 I was injured before. I think, um, even in, even leading into the Olympics in um, 2008, I'd had a lot of injuries leading in, and there's just some meets where I was like, "Ah, oh, screw it, I'll just I'll just race anyway." Even though I haven't had a great prep, I've been injured. You just don't know. And I remember Stoll and I just going, "Oh, we'll just we'll just try and see what happens." And I just did PBs every time. Um, and I guess that gave me a lot of confidence over my career of like, "Well, I'm over. I've only been training for three months, or I've had this injury, and but." 
seems to work every other time. So we'll just, we'll just do it. And that turned into a different training program, which turned into um, just being able to get up and race whenever I wanted. And it, I had confidence every time I raced, um, yeah. despite what I'd, what I'd done in training. Um, so that, that was part of it. And then I just started to have fun with it. You know, you, you play mental games with people and it's, it's all part of it, right? I know you used to, you were, you were uh, I think that 2004 Olympics, I remember after the semi-final in the 100, you said, oh, that's good, mate. Just don't go any faster because, you know, and you just th throw in a bit of chat around and having that sort of attitude as opposed to, yeah, you know, I hope I'm going to win to, to being a bit more, well, they've got to do a certain time to beat me. Um, going into that, in that mentality changes things a lot. Um, and, you know, having that in your training as well of going, well, I don't, I don't need to do 50 Ks a week. I'm happy doing 30, 20, 25, you know, when the long distance guys give you crap for getting out early, I used to own it. I'd mm -hmm. sit there in front of them, have my protein shake, stretch, mm -hmm. have a stretch and I'll be home watching TV while I was still training and, and, and really owning that as a sprinter is a big part of it. I think a lot of people and probably what I did differently in Sydney was thinking that I had to train harder to beat the guys I was training with. And that's probably what, what put me down most of the year, but I still managed to, to get up on race day and still swim pretty well, but it made the rest of my year pretty, um, pretty hard to deal with as well. You're just getting towed up and training every, every day. Um, so yeah, accepting who you are as a swimmer and, and understanding what your training style is because everyone's different end of the day and, and not trying to be someone else is, you know, not just a life lesson, but a, a, a sprinting and a training lesson is you just, you can't train the same as someone else if, if your body can't do it and you've got to accept it and, and own it and still have your confidence when you get up on race day that you've done the hard work that works for you. Yeah. True, mate. And uh, I agree with everything you said and I, and I love it. Thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, 2008 was a breakout year for you. I mean, in terms of breakout, you, you go from being a good sprinter to one of the, one of the best in the world, uh, if not the best, you know, breaking world records in both the 50 and the hundred freestyles. Um, so it, it was an incredible year for you and i want to kind of talk about it a bit but I, I do want to be honest with you a little bit from my perspective um you know i started coaching straight off 2006 you and i were teammates and you and i uh ended up winning a, a silver medal at, in the four by one and in um in melbourne at the commonwealth game so we, we were very close teammates and i and i considered myself a mentor of yours in a way because i was 10 years older so um i i took that on or on yeah, and, and i loved it but um but then I, felt, I jumped straight into coaching and I, and I just happened to, um, you know, be put with two of the, the best sprinters in the world in Fred Brisquet and, and Cesar Cielo. So when 2008 comes along, uh, it's, it, was, it was weird for me, man. Like it, it, it was, you know, I see you as one of the fastest swimmers in the world. It makes me extremely proud to see where you're at. But then on the other side of it, I'm coaching two of your competitors and, and I want to, and I want to beat you, you know? And so it was a very awkward situation for me and even seeing you at the games in 2008 um felt awkward to me um i don't know did you did you get that same sense as well uh not necessarily i think it was i think we were both just in the zone where you didn't want to stop and exchange pleasantries really in the lead up because there's just so much going on but you know yeah it's probably more hard after the races i'd say when things mm. didn't go to plan and, and everything but um i think it, i think that that mutual respect's always been there and it was, it was just, you know, you're just in that zone for me. I was in that, that had the blinkers on. I was just going forward and trying to, mm. trying to get through everything. But, um, but certainly, you know, it's credit to you as well, getting those guys to where they got to as well. Well, I mean, talk, well, look, honestly, you pushed us because you broke the world record first. You know, you, you were the one taking down the world records. And, and certainly in the 50, I think, was the first one, right? You broke, you ended up breaking it. A couple of times, right? I think you broke it in January where you went 21.5. And then I think you broke it at the trials where you went 21.2. So it was like this. You ended up breaking Popov's record, which stood for many years. And Popov's the legend. So you take him down. And then, and then, a, and then a month or two later, you, you drop it even further by another three-tenths. So you took a massive amount of time off the world record. Uh, what yeah. was that period like for you? Funny enough, it was, it was on the back of another injury. <laughs> so... <laughs> When you think about that, I'd, I'd just come back. Uh, when I broke it, I'd come back down from Threadbow. Um, Threadbow is the uh, altitude training? Slightly altitude compared to Flagstaff and other ones. It's probably yeah. a couple of steps up a mountain. but um, It's an isolated place and it's a nice way to get away. And um, 
we'd got, it, it was probably a point where I got to a bit of overtraining and, and my testosterone levels were just so low that I was just struggling to get out of bed and, um, you know, I had no sex drive and everything and it just felt flat as a human. And I remember going up to Threadbow, it was basically a, a recovery training camp for me. We'd done a lot of hard work and a lot of racing leading into that um, earlier in the year and we were supposed to be doing a, a big chunk of hard work up at Threadbow, coming down to race at the New South Wales State Champs. And up at Threadbow, I was doing 2K a day um, and just trying to do heavy weights, trying to keep my strength up. Um, and, you know, I was getting blood tests and trying to make sure I didn't have chronic fatigue or anything. And um, came down from Threadbow and broke a world record. It was just mm. strange. Um, and then I had to get back into hard training again and, um, and then come back to trials probably five weeks later um, after like a three-week taper. So, yeah, it was a really strange process from, you know, and that's obviously when the suits came out as well. And, you know, it was a, it was a really, really just a whirlwind year from that point on. It was, you know, all of a sudden you're fastest in the world and then you've got to qualify for the Olympics and then going into the Olympics as favourite in the 50, then breaking the 100 world record in the lead off of the relay and, kind of being favourite for two things and, and coming away with a silver and, and not even a medal in the 50. So it was a, it was a bittersweet year, to be honest, from, from, from taking everything into consideration and something that, you know, crystal balls and, you know, there's a lot more, I guess, a lot to it from my perspective of, of how it went down that way and things I wish went differently. But, you know, the way I look at it now is I wouldn't be where I am with, with who I am and the kids I have, I guess, if things hadn't happened that way. So... Um, probably wouldn't be where I am in, back in Perth and, and doing doing what I'm doing. So I think uh, I love what I'm doing now and everything happens for a reason. It's hard to see it that way, but um, yeah, it was one of those things and wish it went differently, but uh, things have happened a certain way for a reason. Mate, that's, you know, it's kind of sad to hear you talk like that. And it's, and it's some it's part of, part of the part, the thing that pisses me off about Australia, honestly, you know, um, there's this pressure and there's this expectation and there's this, um, there's this feeling of failure if you don't win a gold medal. Here you are, an Olympic silver medalist, and the way that you talk about it is almost like a failure, like a complete failure. Um, I don't, I don't yeah. know if that's true or not, but does yeah. it feel like that? It does, but I, I know that's not right. And I think over the years, I think it's, you know, it's kind of like, you know, if you, if you come ninth and you miss a final, you're pissed off. If you came 15th, you were never in it, right? And I guess it's that. There was a there was a, a podcast to listen to called The Happiness Lab, which, funnily enough, was talking about Olympic silver medalists, and they're always the unhappiest on the podium mm. because they're either so close to a gold that they're not happy, mm. or you know they they were the favourite and they've come second. Um, but there's a, a small portion of people that you know that maybe are ranked eighth or tenth in the world. And they came sec they came second and they're happy. So I think it's all perspective and. It's really hard to um, take perspective and, and your expectations out of things. And for me, um, the hundred, I just, I, I made a rookie mistake on the biggest stage in the world. I, I swam someone else's race. I didn't, I didn't do my race plan. And I tried to swim Alain Bernard's race and try and change my race because I thought I was way better. And um, it just backfired big time. So instead of me going out, you know, and a 22 low, which is kind of what my strength was, is getting out fast and, and kind of a decent back end and holding on. I tried to save energy for the second 50 and, and hammer it home. And, and he ended up turning in front of me. And uh, the race was over at the 50 meter mark. Well, I will say this, you know, one of the most beautiful swims I've ever seen in my life. And I was there to witness this was your, was your relay lead off. I mean, it didn't look like you took a hard stroke. You looked gorgeous mm. from start to finish, but we're only talking about a 10th of a second between that breaking the world record and then, you know, winning the silver medal, it's, mm. it's a 10th. So in a, if you look at it, it's nothing, but in mm. your mind, there's major mistakes in there that had huge impacts on the, on the final outcome of the race, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, I think I was 0.2 out slower in the 50 in, at, at the 50 meter turn. And, and 0.2 uh, seems like nothing to the normal human, but 0.2 yeah. to you, who's a sprinter, who's one of the fastest swimmers in the world yeah. is a, is an enormous amount of time, right? it's head to shoulder really um you know it's 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 a pretty decent margin um and by the time i hit that turn you know panic sets in you're behind you're not where you want to be and and that's kind of the like you said the thing that 
as a sprinter, you always try and take control of is, is making other people beat you, not putting in a position where you need to swim over the top of them. So um, being behind at the 50 and, and having to try and battle on that second 50 was just foreign to me in, in the, at those times. It was, I was usually half a body, body length in head of most people and, and people catching up to me with me usually touching in front. Um, so trying to hold on and, and that, that lactate tolerance was kind of what my training was based around and getting out fast and, and making people beat me. And um, I put myself in a position that wasn't the case and that's where the, the race took a turn and, and uh, been kicking myself ever since from doing what you train a 10 year old is swim your race plan and, and don't go away from it. And I, I did that in Olympic final. And that's kind of what, you know, led to, led to the downset of, of my mindset. And that was kind of where I never recovered for the 50 I was, you know, 0.6 of a second off my best. And it, even though I mentally wanted to, to get up and, and going, my body was just flat after that. And, and the race and the, the meet kind of ended for me, which was, yeah, really disappointing. Well, let's dig into it a little bit. Let, let's, let's be really honest with, with ourselves. Let's pretend no one else is listening here. Um, even though there's thousands of people listening, but, um, That's it, isn't it? you just hit the 1 million mark. For, for, yeah, for I think so. Yeah, it's pretty close. <laughs> um, but no, listen, seriously, the race wasn't lost at the 50. The race was lost way before that. It was either lost. It was either lost in the warm up or on the way to the warm up, or in the ready room or it was lost right behind the blocks but it was lost before the gun went off at some point. Like what, well, so what's going on? Like what, what's going through your head? Your world record holder, your favorite. Is that, is that replaying in your mind before the race? No, I think, I think I was, again, just, I was, I was confident, which is great, but I, I was confident enough that I, I changed what was working for me. And, and I remember me and Stolly talking going, well, I'll just, I'll get out. Um, I'll get out with him on my shoulder. Um, Oh, so right there. So you're, you're thinking, I'll get out with him. So you're thinking, I'm going to swim his race straight away, even in the race plan. I was, I was comparing my race plan to what, where he was going to be as opposed mm. to just focusing on what I was going to do. So gotcha, gotcha. It related to him and in that mindset, I was like, well, I can, you know, not, not push it as hard this first 50. And I remember it was probably at the 25 meter mark. He just dug in and went and I was, I was in my groove. And before I knew it, he was kind of in front and that rattled me. And that was, that's all it took. Simple thing. Mm -hmm. And that's, what was, that's probably what's the most disappointing thing for me. Not getting silver. I think um, if I had a run, did, did my race plan and come, come seconds, there's nothing I could have done better. When was but, that talk about the race plan? Was that, was that um, after the prelim, like directly after it? Was it back at the, the uh, village? Was it right before it, the race? I think it was before my warm-up, kind of before or after my warm-up, I think. Um, and before that, we just never talked about people. It was just what I was going to do, getting out and around a 20, 22 low, whatever it was mm. going to be, you know, save my legs for the last 50, whatever it was. And, um, yeah, I think we both kick ourselves for that conversation. It was, um, yeah, that's, and that's probably the only disappointment I have with that race. It's not the silver. It's not the expectations or the weight, the weight of the expectations other people had. It was, it was, I didn't swim my race. And that's, that's the only thing you can get annoyed at as a swimmer is if you walk away and know that you didn't try hard enough or you didn't do what you planned, you know, you can't factor in anyone else's races. So um, the fact that he went 47, I think 47.2, if I had gone 47.4, but still done my race and got out in front and died in the ass, there's not much more I could have done. Um, but the fact I just I swam his race was was the biggest mistake he could have made, and I knew that I'd um, I should have done better. Well, listen, man, I appreciate your honesty there because I think it's important to pinpoint when it actually happened because it happened. It didn't happen in the race. I know that for sure. And through my own experiences and through my own failures with some of my athletes, it, I know it didn't happen then. And so to pinpoint actually when it did happen, when the decision was made to swim his race is very, very interesting. I think is very important for, for, you know, current athletes to understand that you can make that mistake at some point, but as soon as you make that decision to swim someone else's race, you're putting it in their hands and you're going to create panic. Once you're in the pool yourself, you're yeah. not going to be in control. And it's, yeah, the first time, the first time I'd done that for a long time at the biggest stage in the world. So kind of the, the, the perfect example of what not to do when you get in that situation. That's, you know, when we look back on when I was 18 in that, um, 
the final to, to make the relay for the 2004 Olympics, I didn't think about anyone else. I was thinking about myself and that's the difference. It's the biggest difference for me being able to handle that pressure as an 18 year old to me being in a similar scenario, being 24, you know, battling out for a gold medal that qualifying for the Olympics was my gold medal when I was 18 and I was able to, to manage that and, you know, doing it six years later and, thinking wiser i made the mistake i could have made when i was 18 but just a lot further down the track well listen mate there is a consolation here um i swam at two olympics and uh never won a medal so um i'm i'm not as good as you and never was never will be uh, you're an olympic silver medalist so there's something to there's a huge accomplishment now if i was an olympic silver medalist i'd be extremely proud of that i'm i mean i'm proud that i'm an olympian i'm proud that i swam in the final but I never won a medal. And, and that's one of those things that haunts me. So for you to be a silver medalist, you should be extremely proud of that, mate. Uh, it's a yeah. huge accomplishment for sure. I think I am. I am now. I think it was at the time. Um, it's hard, that perspective. It's really hard to, to look past that. I think when you have high expectations of yourself and you know that was a bit in grasp. And it, it took a long time to, to get past that. And it's, it's, I kind of get annoyed with myself at, at not being happy about it. And I think that's where the you sort of touched on that, that expectation of Australian media and, and they jump on the bandwagon every Olympics of, you know, we're, we're not really, we're kind of forgotten in between Olympic cycles at world champs and, you know, com games, but that's, you know, without the US and other, and other countries involved, it's a lot easier to, to get a, an international gold there. But Olympics is kind of where the pressure really comes on and it really shouldn't be a part of, of a swimmer's mindset and, and, and that, um, changing your perception of, of what's what's successful and i think that's probably something it took me a while to get over yeah um mate listen i appreciate your time you've been awesome i want to i want to leave you with a couple of things um obviously next year we we think the olympics are going to go forward um who are your uh who are your predictions for your your top three in the in the 50 and the 100 uh, or or maybe just who, who's going to fight for the gold and silver in the 50 and the 100 you think uh, I mean, you know, if it was happening this year, easily to say Caleb Dressel, um, Kyle Chalmers in the 100, just mm -hmm. no one else apart from those two. Yep. Um, and, you know, in the 50, in the 50, it's, it's, uh, it's probably a bit tighter, but, you know, Caleb Dressel, it's just yeah, having the start, the endurance and, and what he has. It's, um, yeah, I'm kind of glad I'm not swimming these days at the moment as well. You know, it's, it's, it's just amazing to see what these guys are doing at the moment. Um, um, I think that just the, the curveball now is, is a year between, you know, I remember from, from 2008 being 23 to being 24 the next year, how dramatically my body changed, how much harder it was to, to, to back up after a training session. And these guys are around that age and it was a big opportunity, I think, for, for up and comers that, that no one knows about yet to really, really rattle some cages. And that's the thing I'd be worried about being one of the top is that I was ready now. If I was, if that was 2008 for me, and I had to wait till 2009, a lot can happen in that year, and I think that's the biggest opportunity for guys that are probably just that little bit behind to to, to jump out and, and to to really to really snatch something that wasn't 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 a possibility until now, and, and use that to your advantage. There's a lot of a lot of advantages to being stuck in the shadows for a little bit and being able to take people by surprise. So I'm pretty excited to see what happens in the next the next year, to be honest. Yeah. Well, mate, I think a lot of people would probably say, you know, Dressel's the, the favorite in the 50 and the 100, but obviously Kyle Chalmers is the defending Olympic champ and has every right and, and every possibility to beat him. What is, what is Kyle? You probably know him. I don't know him as well as you may know him. What does he do well and, and why do you think he has a chance to beat Dressel in the 100? I think he's got the right mindset and I think that's what a lot of sprinting comes down to. You can be the fittest, the fastest, the strongest and, and, uh, you know, make a mistake in your race plan and that's all it takes. So I think what Kyle really has that I think Dressel definitely has as well is that that mindset of once you step behind the blocks, he's just not going to give up until that last cent, not even at the last centimetre. He gives up once he's touched the wall and you can see it in that back end. I think Dressel's got that speed and it's, and to get out in front of him. But I know if Kyle's close enough in that 50, that's, that's the thing you just can't account for. On a, on a race day at Olympic, an Olympic final is that last 10 metres. That's the guts. That's where that, that, that true grit just comes into it. And that's when those champions are made and where they're just able to swim over the top of people. And they, they love being in the situation of being behind and having to catch up.
And I think that's the difference between, um, you know, that, that my style of swimming where I tried to get in front and not, not give up and not lose, whereas Kyle loves being behind and just motoring people down. So I know if he's in with a sniff at that 50, even at that last 25, that's where, where he becomes the favourite. You, you see that gap, but it's only maybe a difference in that much, and that's when you know Kyle's got a chance. Yeah. Well, mate, you had a, an incredible career. When did you decide that that, that was enough? How did you decide what, to, to hang it up? Um, it was – so it was after I made my so comeback, I had the year off and had my two shoulder surgeries um, and got into that new mentality of swimming and just training hard when I needed to and, and doing sort of 20 to 25 Ks a week, 15 Ks I think it was, and um, uh, qualified – Won the 50, went 21.8, I think it was, or 21.6 after a few months. And, but I had to get another shoulder surgery. My shoulder was still, still playing up. So I qualified for the Com Games team um, and went straight to shoulder surgery the week after, basically, and, and tried to get a shoulder surgery done and try to get back for the Com Games. I think it was three months after, three or four months after. So um, did that, did the recovery doing all my rehabs as I usually do and then got into training again up in, we were in Singapore training camp and started training and my shoulder was just sore again. I remember I got home and I was with my now wife back then and, and um, I was just miserable and injuries always made me miserable. And that's when I turned to cooking and, and therapeutic things that I just really enjoyed that took my mind off swimming. And, and she just said to me, you're miserable. And I said, yeah, I'll just, you know, part of the injury process. And she said, well, why do you do it if you're so miserable? And no one had ever asked me that before. And it's just part of who I was. I just get grumpy and annoyed that I was at home when other people were training and I knew that I was missing out on, on improving. And, and no one had asked me that before. I said, you know what? I, I don't know. And I quit the next day, mm. basically. I, I, I sat up all night just thinking, and I was like, I'm pretty miserable. And I've got, you know, I'm, I think I was 28 or 29 at the time. I, I, just just about to open my third uh, third venue, and I just had all these opportunities in 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 life after swimming knocking down the door, and it came down to me. You know, the reason I was still swimming is I wanted to get to four Olympics. No male uh, Australian had made four swimming Olympics yet, and that was kind of I guess on the back of London and and Beijing. I kind of wanted to leave on a another positive and uh, leave a tiny bit of a legacy and that was kind of what was driving me. It wasn't the love of the sport or wanting to compete anymore. It was, it was more of a, I guess, a vanity thing, which probably wasn't the right, right attitude. And I looked at, I looked, I thought to myself in 10 years time, the next two years of my life would have to be dedicated to swimming for the, for the possibility to make a fourth Olympics. It wasn't guaranteed. Mm. Um, whereas I had, you know, the opportunity straight then to dive into hospitality and to forge my career and my life for the rest of my life. And I thought in 10 years time, will I be in a better place swimming for two years or, or getting into business and getting into real life? And um, that's what I made my decision based on. I thought, you know, in 10 years time, another Olympics and training for two years and, you know, on a swimmer's pay and having to, to give up a lot of things socially and, and, and personally, um, in 10 years time, would I be happy that I made that, made that leap? Um, and I decided that it'd be better to jump into hospitality and, and to start focusing on my, my life and, and getting out of swimming. And that was, that's what the decision was made. And yeah, it was made, yeah, 12 hours after that conversation. No, uh, well, yeah, there's, there's always a, a, a breaking point, but, um, you know, you, you were, you, you did outstanding, mate. You did incredible things for Australia and you should be super proud of world records, you know, Olympic medals, all sorts of things. And, uh, and just being a leader uh, within the community as well. So mate, I, when I took over as head coach of Auburn, they gave me a huge office. And um, so I had, I had the choice to hang all sorts of things in my office. And then and I think you know this, but I, uh, I decided to hang one thing that was right in front of my desk on the, on the huge wall in front of me. And that was a picture of you, uh, underwater of you uh, breaking the world record at the uh, Australian trials. And mm. the picture is actually of just pure perfection in technique where you are aligned up so well that 
um, it, like I said, it's just perfection. This, this photograph, I think you've seen it, but um, it, it was just one of those things where I wanted people to walk into my office and say, that's perfection in technique. And, and that's one of the things that you did so well is that your technique was flawless. Apart from all the hard work and all the stuff that you did, you were really a technician. And the reason why you broke world records is because you were in, incredible with your technique and that, and that, that hung in front of me and, and reminded me, um, you know, of the, of the special relationship we had and just the type of athlete you were, mate. So I'm super proud of you and, and thanks for coming on today. I appreciate it. I oh, appreciate it, Hawkey. And that's, um, yeah, very, very touching that you, you had that up there and certainly uh, think back of our times at all those swim mates and had a lot of fun. And I think that 2004 being an 18 year old kid, you know, you, you certainly took me under your wing and made me feel comfortable on the team and, and gave me enough shit that I didn't get too, too big headed as well. So I think um, that was always the best part about you. You were, you were, you could keep people in line, but in a, in a, in a way that made them feel welcome and certainly made that team a, a, a nice place to be. Yeah, mate. Well, listen, you're a legend. I'm glad you're on my uh, podcast because I only have legends on it. So uh, you're one of them now. And um, thanks for coming on, mate. The kids are inside waiting for you. So get back in there and uh, get to work. Another hour. Give me some. Give me, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> all right, mate. Hey, listen. Great chatting with you. Uh, take care. All right. Thanks, Augie. Cheers, mate. See you, mate.